modern colonization. Will the Chinese end up owning the African continent? There is a problem happening on the African continent right now. The big criticism, of course, over these projects is that many of them are simply not needed by many of these countries. During the scramble for Africa, a period when most European nations wanted to grab a piece of the resource-rich African continent, they frequently used force against the natives, which led to the loss of many lives. But hold on. It looks like a country might have found a way to take over another country with the stroke of a pen. Things have changed. This is the 21st century and there is a new kid on the block. China is Africa's largest trading partner and has already spent billions of dollars. It's a fantastic example of, of how Europe has lost the game and has lost its upper hand in Africa. It's game over. Sorry, it's game over. We have over. to admit that, that China is actually taking the lead here, not the Western countries. China's ever-growing demand for raw materials for its growing industry has seen it try to satisfy this demand with an unprecedented form of colonization. The debt trap diplomacy. China convinces poorer nations to borrow huge sums of money from Chinese banks. Money that is supposedly going to help them develop economically. But as it turns out, China convinces these poorer nations to build infrastructure that has no economic benefit to them. When these countries fail to pay back their loans, as most of them will inevitably do, the Chinese government then swoops in to take control of these assets without offering a chance to renegotiate the terms of debt repayment. If you're paying three times the price that the road costs, then you've got a problem, you've got a debt burden. So it becomes this kind of difficult question of should there be Chinese influence with Chinese funding or should Africa just not develop? A Chinese loan doesn't come with a lot of political strings, but it doesn't mean China has no conditions. For any country to be involved in Africa, if you want to really compete with other countries by vilifying the other country, China, 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 by bad-mouthing the other country, China in particular, it will not work. What if I told you that what China really wants is not colonizing Africa as the media portrays it to be? What if I told you that there is another side of the coin that you're not being shown? Would you call me a liar for saying that? Well, I promise you that I'm going to be as unbiased as I can as I take you down this rabbit hole. If you live in Africa, I've got no doubt that you have heard some variation of the news that China is colonizing Africa. And the way that China is doing this is by using debt. In order to back their claim, most critics of the Sino-African relations almost always refer to the Hambantota deal, a deal that was signed between a Chinese corporation and Sri Lanka Ports Authority. I think it's fundamentally important to understand the intricate details of this deal before we go any further, because this deal forms the basis of the dead trap narrative as I'd like to call it. As the story goes, the Chinese government pushed Sri Lanka into borrowing money from the China Exim Bank to finance the Hambantota project that had no prospect of success. The failure of this port to generate enough revenue to finance the servicing of its own debt sent Sri Lanka into default, which is exactly what China wanted. China would then proceed to demand the port itself as collateral following Sri Lanka's failure to service the debt. The Sri Lankan government had no choice but to surrender the port to China in a debt equity exchange. Is it already too late? Well, I think in some cases it's too China's late. China has recently been accused of trying to take over Uganda's sole international airport. China is willing to provide another $60 billion in support to Africa. Most critics say that projects that are being financed by China in Africa are a replication of the Hambantota deal. But, as it turns out, none of this actually represents what's on the ground. A simple scratch to the surface will reveal to you a much more reliable explanation to the Hambantota port deal. The giving up of the Hambantota port was not a debt equity deal, as other media sources would like you to believe. It turns out that before acquiring a loan from China, Sri Lanka had approached both the US and India and was turned down. Sri Lanka only turned to China after being turned down by the US and India following the release of the Rambo report. The first feasibility study for the port was financed by the Canadian International Development Agency and was carried out by a Canadian engineering firm, SNC Lavelin. The study concluded that the building of a port at Hambantota was feasible 
The Canadians failed to move forward because of the political turmoil that had plagued Sri Lanka at the time. Another feasibility report was released in 2006 by a Danish engineering firm called Rambo. The study made similar propositions to the plans that were proposed by the earlier study, which proposed that a single company would have to undertake all the steps required to get the port up and running. The same company was going to operate the port for a given period of time once construction was finished. The turning down of Sri Lanka's request for funding by the US and India did not go unnoticed. A Chinese construction firm called China Harbor Engineering had been watching from a distance. They relentlessly lobbied for the project. The China Exim Bank agreed to fund the project and China Harbor Engineering won the contract in 2007. During this time, Sri Lanka was in the middle of a bloody civil war. And from this gesture, we noticed that China was willing to take a risk in a war-torn country, a risk that other countries were not willing to take. I will talk about China's risk-taking approach later in the video. The China Exim Bank offered a $307 million commercial loan to Sri Lanka for the first phase of the project. The first phase of the project was finished on schedule, and instead of waiting for the first phase to generate income, which was recommended by the Rambo team, Sri Lanka borrowed another $757 million from China Exim Bank. By 2014, the Hambantota port was losing money due to the lack of experienced operators, hence the leasing of the port to China Mechan's port for 99 years. It should be noted that proceeds from the lease agreement were not used to pay off the debt that was obtained for the construction of the port. Instead, they were used to boost the country's depleting foreign reserves. The agreements pertaining to the loans were not amended as part of this deal, and Sri Lanka is still obliged to pay for the loans it obtained from China Exim Bank, which is yet more evidence that the Hambantota deal was not a debt equity swap, which is the cancellation of debt in exchange for equity or an asset. China has financed a lot of similarly massive infrastructure projects in Africa, notably the African Union headquarters in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, Dorale Multipurpose Port in Djibouti, and a 480km standard gauge railway in Kenya, which I'm going to use as an example. The railway runs from the port city of Mombasa to the capital of Nairobi in the interior. The railway line was constructed at a cost of over 3.8 billion United States dollars, of which 90% was paid directly to a Chinese contractor by the Chinese government, which means that although the money never really got into its hands, the Kenyan government is still obliged to pay over 3 billion United States dollars in debt. The standard gauge railway has reduced the travel time from Mombasa to Nairobi by more than 5 hours. Freight trains complete the same journey in less than 8 hours. The cost of cargo transport has significantly dropped due to the economies of scale. A single train has the capacity to haul over 216 20-foot containers. The same amount of load would require about 108 haulage trucks. The emergence of trade centers and urbanization along the railway's route are going to be other indirect benefits of this railway line. The railway has improved regional trade. Fast clearance of Mombasa port makes Kenya a preferred entry point and export route for landlocked East African countries like Uganda and Rwanda, which helps grow these countries' economies and Kenya's economy at the same time. Despite all these benefits, the construction of Kenya's standard gauge railway has not been short of inconveniences. By borrowing money, Kenya puts its debt on the brink of unsustainable levels. The situation is so bad that the IMF has added Kenya to its list of debt-distressed countries. Environmental concerns have been raised as the locomotives have hit several lions and buffaloes as they traverse through the Savo National Park. Another concern being raised by many is that, in the case of the need for new parts for the railway and for the locomotives, they need to be sourced directly from China, which makes it harder to make repairs since you cannot outsource the parts from anywhere else in the world. The Kenyan example is one of many projects that China has or is financing in Africa. However, what we can conclude from the example of Kenya is that these are normal projects which come with realistic challenges and benefits. The acquiring of excessive debt should not be blamed on the lender alone, which in this case is China, but on the borrowers as well. China doesn't show up in Africa in a vacuum. 
the African governments have a lot of power to set the rules. So if China is not aiming to use debt to seize the sovereign territory of African nations, then what's the point of giving out risky loans to these countries anyway? For that, we're going to need a brief history lesson. 29 nations with a population of more than 1 billion 400 million persons attend the historic conference in Indonesia's capital city of Bandung. The most significant early development to the Sino-African relations came under the rule of Mao Zedong, most notably in 1955, following the first Asia-Africa conference, where a Chinese delegation outlined the five principles of peaceful coexistence that included mutual respect for sovereign territory, mutual non-aggression, non-interference in each other's internal affairs, equality and mutual benefit, and peaceful coexistence. Premier Nereli has brought his nation to the promised land of independence. At the Uhuru Stadium, the articles of independence were handed by the Duke to the country's Prime Minister. One more independent country, the state of Uganda. As more and more African countries became independent in the 1960s, China started to emphasize on the establishment of diplomatic relations with independent African states, including providing support for African liberation movements that wanted to overthrow the colonial rule. China's primary goal of the Sino-African relations during this time was the pursuit of diplomatic recognition of the People's Republic of China across the African continent and ultimately replace the Republic of China also known as Taiwan, in the United Nations Security Council. In the month of October 1971, the People's Republic of China achieved its goal of getting admitted to the United Nations and of replacing the Republic of China in the Security Council through the support of 26 African states. In the 1980s, after its admission to the United Nations, China was going through a remarkably prosperous period. Everything seemed well, except for one thing. A lot of Chinese citizens had become exposed to the Western way of governance. There were growing sentiments among Chinese citizens for the need for political and economic reforms. After the passing on of Hu Yobang, who was the general secretary of the Chinese Communist Party. He had been removed from his position because he supported what the Communist Party called bourgeois liberalism, a fancy way of saying that the Chinese were just being crybabies. So the Chinese gathered at Tiananmen Square on the day of his funeral, demanding democratic reforms from the Chinese Communist Party. The Chinese government then declared martial law. On the 4th of June 1989, the Chinese military was ordered to take back control of the Tiananmen Square and to open fire at anyone who stood in their way. Some estimates say that thousands died and many more thousands got injured during these protests. But for such actions, there is almost always a price to pay. And it would not be too long until the West were critical of the Chinese government's actions. China was determined to revamp its international relations and therefore started developing its relationships with the developing world. China realized that it had to transform its relationship with Africa from political to economic cooperation. Since it was getting sidelined by the West, none of the countries in Africa had condemned the Tiananmen massacre, with the presidents of Namibia and Burkina Faso publicly backing China's response. In addition, the end of Cold War resulted in less interest in Africa by the West, and that allowed China to engage more effectively with Africa. In this context, it's worthwhile not to think of Africa as one gigantic nation as is often the case in many discussions, but to think of it as a continent comprising of 54 individual countries, 53 of which do not recognize Taiwan. One of China's eight principles governing its foreign aid is the provision of interest-free or low-interest loans. By giving out loans to countries that would be deemed ineligible for loans by most other countries, China becomes a messiah to developing nations in Africa, and China in turn wins itself allies, a potential 54 countries that are affiliated to China. This gives China an edge over its competitors when it comes to international matters. Each of the 54 countries in Africa has a vote in the United Nations General Assembly, and their support for China has helped it gain a seat in the United Nations Security Council. 
China offers African countries with an alternative partnership where they receive financial aid without interference in their domestic affairs. This is wildly different from dealing with Western countries whose foreign aid is often tied to conditions like governmental or environmental reforms. As one Chinese diplomat once said, we've never and never will in the future attach any kind of political conditions to these aid and development projects. Although China does not directly interfere with the internal politics of the countries it deals with, it does sell firearms to these countries, and those firearms will often be used to oppress citizens living under authoritarian regimes. There has been growing sentiments that China might have military interests in Africa, but it has only one military base that it recently set up in Djibouti as at the time of recording. We can't ignore the fact that Africa is a resource-rich continent and it only makes sense that China would like to have its share of the cake. China is currently the world's largest consumer of some important metals like iron, copper and lithium whose demand is only going to rise with the advent of electric vehicles in order to feed the demand for raw materials fueled by its growing economy. China has begun to look beyond its borders and Africa seems to be just the right place for that. However, with all that being said, China's priority for economic growth over the protection of the environment has devastating consequences to the African environment. This means that the compliance to environmental standards will be ensured by African countries hosting these corporations. But host countries often have trouble dealing with these issues. The environmental agencies often find it difficult to deal with corruption and struggle with getting enough manpower. Competition from fellow African countries removes an incentive for setting high standards. Therefore, countries will solve this by setting lower standards to be more attractive to Chinese investment. In addition to that, resources are often the only form of payment these countries have, so they allow Chinese practice of resource extraction at any cost. My opinion is that making political accountability a prerequisite for investment only worsens the poverty situation in Africa. On the other hand, setting the bar too low for investment eligibility gives some sort of incentive for authoritarian governments on the continent to keep oppressing citizens. The invasion of Africa by Chinese corporations also makes local industries less competitive, thus making African countries more reliant on China. All that being said, China's engagement with Africa is both economic and geopolitical, with benefits that go both ways. Africa satisfies China's hunger for diplomatic support and the need for raw materials for its immensely huge industry. And China gives African countries the financial support that they so desperately need.